What is glyphosate? Is glyphosate the same as Roundup? Is there a connection between glyphosate and the skyrocketing rates of chronic disease? That's a big question to start off with. Glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup, as well as in many other herbicides. It's used uh, to kill weeds, and it's a tremendous uh, bonus in, in making crops cheap, because they, especially because they have GMO engineering technology that can protect the crop from the, from the toxic chemical. Otherwise, it kills all plants. So it's a very toxic chemical to plants. Um, and it's, you know, there's a tremendous evidence in my view that it is causing, it is a major causal factor in a long list of autoimmune, neur neurological, you know, oncological, all kinds of diseases that are going up dramatically in our society, exactly in step with the rise in glyphosate usage on core crops. So there's pr tremendous data that shows incredible correlations between the rise in these diseases and the rise in glyphosate. And of course, what people answer is that correlation doesn't mean causation. They dismiss it because of that. But that's where you start. You know, that's how they found tobacco causes lung cancer because they saw that smokers got lung cancer. What's the link between glyphosate and obesity, diabetes, and kidney disease? Right, well, so there's the same thing. Those are three of the diseases that are going up dramatically in match, uh, exactly. And uh, so my study has been involved in trying to figure out how glyphosate could be causing these diseases. And I think it's a major disruption of metabolism in general. And uh, obesity very clearly seems to chase glyphosate around the world. When people start eating a Western diet, they start getting fat in, the, in, in each country one by one. The U.S. has had, you know, we're one of the most obese countries in the world and we consume more glyphosate than just about any other country. Um, kidney disease, I think it's very strongly linked in uh, evidence that uh, people who use glyphosate, agricultural workers in Central America are dying at a young age from a strange kidney disease um, that is not understood. And several papers have come out proposing that it's glyphosate that's used sprayed on the, on the uh, sugarcane crop right before harvest. And then they harvest the crop, they get up close and personal with that glyphosate and they, their kidneys get destroyed by it. And so um, diabetes, of course, is also an epidemic and it's connected to obesity. And, um, and again, it's because I think glyphosate disrupts metabolism. And I should say that I have a book coming out where I discuss how, how glyphosate could be causing these diseases, um, which is gonna be released by Chelsea Green Publishers in uh, June of this year. How are we exposed to glyphosate even if we don't eat GMO foods? Yes, this is something that people don't realize because they think if they're buying non-GMO, they're safe. And that is absolutely not true. In fact, some of the highest levels of glyphosate are found in non-GMO foods, particularly wheat, oats, um, sugars, you know, um, sugar cane, for example, which gets sprayed right before harvest. In fact, this is why all of these um, crops that are sprayed right before harvest as a desiccant, not as a weed killer, but as a desiccant to actually dry out the crop, increase the yield, synchronize the, the seed production. Um, and so there's a lot of good reasons to do it, except for the big bad one, which is that it goes into the seed and it ends up being extremely high levels of glyphosate in, for example, chickpeas and garbanzo beans. I mean, these are things that people consider to be healthy food. So, you know, it's, um, you have to watch for the certified organic label. Non-GMO is definitely not enough. In fact, higher levels are found in non-GMO crops in many cases than in GMO crops. What other crops are sprayed with glyphosate right before harvest? Yeah, so uh, chickpeas and garbanzo beans, all of the legumes, many kinds of nuts, um, like sunflower seeds, so things that go into the oils, um, make oils, vegetable oils. Um, oats, uh, barley, a wheat, and wheat is a big one because I think that's how you connect it to celiac disease. And those are the main ones, I think. How can someone get glyphosate out of their body? Yeah, well, that's extremely difficult. And especially if you read my book, you'll see that I believe glyphosate integrates into the tissues, um, into proteins in the tissues all over the body. And that becomes extremely hard to get rid of because it, it even becomes hard to break down those proteins that are contaminated with glyphosate. But um, you certainly can uh, do some things. Obviously, eating a certified organic diet is the best way to avoid exposure. Once you have exposure, um, there are some things that, that have been suggested to work, um, in particular, uh, humic acid and fulvic acid, which are organic, complex organic molecules from the soil. People have shown some success, even in animal studies, uh, for those to help to clear 
bind to and take the gly glycosate out through the feces. I have been claiming that certain bacteria, there are certain bacteria that can break it down. Actually, most bacteria can't. It has a, it has a difficult bond that's hard to break. So most of the bacteria don't know how to break it down, but there are a few. And in particular, Acetobacter is one of the species that some of the strains of Acetobacter can break it down. So I'm hoping that if you take apple cider vinegar and sauerkraut and those kinds of uh, fermented foods, you're actually getting Acetobacter culture that can uh, potentially metabolize glyphosate, which I think is the best way because you're actually getting rid of it. When you, when you bind it and take it out through the feces, it's still in the environment, it hasn't been removed. How do we know the increase in autism isn't just from genetics? I mean, that's just ridiculous that the increase is just from genetics because genetic diseases don't go up. I mean, it's a stable thing in, in, the, in the culture. You know, you don't expect a dramatic rise in a disease that has only a genetic um, ex explanation. And in fact, it's clear to me that autism is a combination of genetics and environment. And it's just certain kids have certain susceptibility genes. So the particular genes that are uh, disrupted by environmental chemicals such as glyphosate if you happen to already have a defective version of that gene, then you get hit much harder by that environmental exposure. And so some of the kids are more susceptible because of certain genetic mutations that they have. But eventually I think all of the kids are, are vulnerable to um, acquiring autism just from the environment alone, if it gets bad enough. The autism spectrum was not covered well when you went to graduate school because the autism rate in 1970 was only one in 2,222 compared to one in 68 today. Why do you think every other child born in 2032 will be autistic? And how accurate do you think your prediction will be? So actually it's one in 54 now. This is a, it was very quietly announced last April when COVID was going crazy and it hardly not a buzz at all on the news, but it came and then CDC announced the new number one in 54. It's been going steadily up. I, I've plotted, what I did was I plotted the rise in autism over time and I projected the curve. Uh, it was an exponential growth and I simply projected it into the future, just looking at uh, which uh, year would it reach the point where the children born that year would have a, a one in two rate of autism. And that comes out to be 2032. So if we keep it up, what we're doing, and it appears that we are keeping it up, I predict that we will have uh, half the kids born in 2032 will end up on the autism spectrum. And that'll be 80% of the boys. Why isn't there more discussion in the media about the increase in the rates of autism? I wish I knew. I feel like it should be all over the news. And it's very frustrating to me that, you know, autism is actually a much bigger problem right now in our society than COVID-19. I mean, COVID-19 is affecting mostly old people. Autism is affecting children. And this is just going to, you know, it, it burdens the parent for the entire child's life. The child can never leave home. Many of these autistic kids are not able to function, can't go to work. They're going to be a responsibility for their parents for the rest of their lives. So right now, the kids are growing up and we have all kinds of adult services that aren't there because we've got this new wave of adult autism. The, this is, I think the country is going to be overwhelmed by the autism burden you know, in, an, in the not too distant future. We just will not be able to handle the financial burden, the emotional burden of all these sick kids uh, in the near future. And I just don't understand why the media is not on, on fire with this, especially the government. The government should be urgently trying everything it can to figure out what's causing this, this epidemic. And instead they just pretend it's not happening. You have a chapter in your book called Is Autism Caused by Sulfate Deficiency and Excess Aluminum Exposure? Please tell us what this is about. Uh, yeah, well, that's a, that's a really interesting story. I actually got into the sulfate uh, idea for autism quite early, and it was uh, based on Rosemary Waring's work. She worked uh, with autistic kids you know, back in the 1990s. She published some papers. She identified that something was really wrong with sulfate and autism. The autistic kids were not handling sulfate correctly. They were actually getting rid of it through the urine, but they had low levels in their blood. So they weren't able to, to move it around. They weren't able to get it to where it needed to go and use it the way it needs to be used. And uh, heparin sulfate is a sulfated molecule that is in the brain ventricles, in the, inside the ventricles of the brain, the middle of the brain. It's absolutely crucial for the development of neurons during embryo, embryonic development. And autistic kids have been shown, post-mortem studies have shown they have a deficiency in heparin sulfate in those brain ventricles. And it's also been shown to be characteristic of mice that have, there are mice that breed true to autism, they use this to study autism. They also have uh, depleted 
heparin sulfate in their brain ventricles. And in fact, an amazing study that simply um, specifically messed up the ability to make heparin sulfate in the brain ventricles. And that was the only defect these, these mice had. And they showed all the mouse features of autism. So I think it's absolutely crucial. The brain development of the neurons depends on adequate heparin sulfate, which is not there because of a, uh, a systemic uh, issue with sulfate uh, homeostasis in the autistic kids. I know there's a, well, there's a cholesterol problem with, um, well, I'll get to that later. <laughs> so. Why has the obesity rate gone from under 10% in the United States in the 1960s to over 40% in 2021? Well, as I said, I think glyphosate is a major player there. And there are other chemicals. I mean, we have so many chemicals that are going up in our environment and we do not have adequate uh, regu regulatory agencies to, uh, to keep that from happening. Uh, especially, I think the United States has been very trigger happy with all these chemicals and drugs too, you know, that are disrupting our metabolism. Uh, glyphosate, I think is the key player. I believe it's the, if I had to pick one as the most likely target for causing the obesity epidemic, I would pick glyphosate. Of course, as I said, it's very strongly correlated with glyphosate. Charts show perfect match in the rise in obesity in the United States with a rise in glyphosate usage on core crops. And glyphosate uh, has been found, for example, uh, Anthony Samso tested lipase. It's an enzyme that breaks down fast. He got it, a porcine lipase from a pig's version of lipase from a lab, chemistry lab, found high levels of glyphosate in it. And he suspects, and I agree with him, that glyphosate is actually disrupting lipase's ability to break down fats. And so what's happening is you have to store the fats because you can't break them down. And there's other arguments that I develop in my book, other proteins that can be affected by glyphosate that would mess up the ability to um, metabolize fat. So what, so what, that, what happens then is that you, your body's storing fat because it can't metabolize it. And there's also the role of uh, toxic chemicals that are fat soluble. Glyphosate uh, interferes with the enzymes in the liver. This has been shown experimentally that break down, that metabolize other toxic chemicals that are fat soluble. Glyphosate is not fat soluble, but the other ones are. If they can't be broken down by the liver, then you have to build fat tissues in order to be able to safely store them, sequester them in those fat tissues so you won't get sick. Please discuss the role of biotechnology or agriculture technology as they relate to plant breeding, biodiversity, genetic engineering, pesticide management, soil management, water management, and animal management. How have advances in these fields developed in a positive manner? What potential pitfalls may exist as a result of further development? And that's a really big question. And I, I'll give you a fairly short answer because I think that biotech has been heralded as a wonderful solution to our to providing food, you know, like the world hunger. It, it, the idea is that it's solving world hunger by being able to produce food cheaply in great quantities. You have these huge mega farms that require very little labor. So, I mean, you see the countries that industrialize their agriculture end up with many fewer, much fewer percentage of their population working in agriculture. So that frees up people to do jobs in technology, advance all those, all those things in AI and all of that sort of stuff, you know, more um, getting to a more advanced state in the society because you don't have to devote so much labor to growing crops. And so that, you know, you could argue that's a feature. What I think it's causing is, you know, a great increase in all these different diseases. Um, medical costs are going way up. So you don't really save money on, on food if you're gonna spend all that money on healthcare. And of course you're feeling sick too, so you're not happy. So it's really a very nasty trade-off to say, I'm gonna have cheap food. And at the same time, I'm gonna be sick and I'm gonna to have to pay a lot of money to get medical treatment. And then I'm gonna be suffering from all these diseases and all these symptoms. It, it's, it's not a win when you look at it that way. How important is sunlight to our health? Should we wear sunglasses? <laughs> I hate sunglasses. And I actually, when I see a little child, a little two-year-old in sunglasses, I, I, ha I have an urge to rip them off of his face. I don't, I act very polite, but <laughs> uh, I think that um, we have been taught that the sun is, uh, is toxic and that we need to avoid it at all costs, stay inside, wear long sleeves, put on sunscreen, you know, wear sunglasses, keep, protect your eyes. I, I ne never wear sunglasses. I have no issues with my eyes. You know, I haven't even had a, you know, they have to do these, uh, <laughs> surgery for cataracts. I don't have any problem with cataracts. And I've been out in the sun a lot. My eyes have gotten plenty of sunlight exposure. My eyes are healthy. I'm, I don't even wear glasses, you know, very healthy eyes. And, uh, and it frustrates me that people think they're protecting their eyes when they're probably actually harming them because the eyes know how to use the sunlight very effectively. And actually the pineal gland behind the eyes 
um, makes sulfate in response to sunlight. And then it uses that sulfate and attaches it to melatonin and ships melatonin sulfate out into the cerebral spinal fluid in the evening to prepare you for sleep. And that melatonin sulfate is essential to help you sleep. As you know, melatonin is a very important sleep agent and it's providing the sulfate to the brain to help it clear debris, clear cellular debris. And so when you get Alzheimer's, you have a defect, defect in ability to clear cellular debris. And that is likely because of a deficiency in the sulfate that is being provided normally through the melatonin sulfate triggered initially from exposure of the pineal gland behind the eyes to sunlight. In your book, Toxic Legacy, you present stunning evidence based on countless published peer-reviewed studies that glyphosate plays a major role in skyrocketing rates of chronic diseases, including cancer, gut dysbiosis, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, autism, infertility, and more. You describe glyphosate's unique mechanism of toxicity that slowly erodes human health over time, as well as its impact on soil ecosystems and the nutritional quality of the nation's food supply. Please tell us more about this. <laughs> yes, that's a big, big topic. And this is the, the core topic of my book that will come out in June that I mentioned earlier, Toxic Legacy. Um, my belief is that glyphosate is uh, acting as a glycine analog. Glycine is an amino acid. It's the smallest amino acid, one of the basic coding blocks of, of coding units of proteins. And um, glyphosate is a complete glycine molecule. So it is also an amino acid, except that it has extra material stuck onto its nitrogen atom. And that extra material makes it behave biophysically and biochemically very differently from glycine. But it doesn't keep it from fitting into the socket where glycine is supposed to fit in the code so that it can end up in the proteins where the code says, I want glycine here, because it's a DNA code that codes for the protein sequence, the amino acid sequence in the protein. I mean, the code says, I want glycine. If there's a glyphosate molecule available, it will fit into the slot. It will add it into the, integrate it into the protein that it's making and then change the characteristics of that protein. And if this is true, it's absolutely stunning and it has enormous consequences and it can explain all these diseases. I can take each disease one by one and say which proteins would be affected by glyphosate in this way to cause this disease. And that's the game that I've been playing. And it, it, everything fits like hand in glove. It's actually quite remarkable. Once you assume that's happening, then you can explain why it's causing fatty liver disease and why it's causing diabetes and why it's causing high serum cholesterol and why it's causing Alzheimer's and autism, all those diseases. You can find specific proteins that you can predict would be disrupted by glyphosate to cause that disease. And many of these proteins that I'm finding are actually have been shown to be suppressed by glyphosate. Proteins that I would predict it would mess up in this way have been shown experimentally to be suppressed by glyphosate. So the whole thing packages up quite in a, quite an amazing fashion. And that is the, what my book is mostly about. What are your predictions for human health in the year 2032? <laughs> I hope there'll be some of us that are still alive. <laughs> it's looking really bad to me. I mean, I think, and I actually think COVID-19 is a reflection of glyphosate. I really believe that um, COVID-19 uh, bad outcomes are caused by chronic glyphosate exposure. Those people who are getting sick, sickest with COVID-19 have all these comorbidities, you know, various diseases that are, are associated, particularly diabetes and high blood pressure and Alzheimer's, I mean, all of these uh, cancer, all these diseases that are uh, risk factors for bad outcome are also highly correlated with glyphosate in terms of the rise in our, in our um, population. And, um, I think glyphosate, I have a whole chapter in my book on glyphosate and the immune system. And glyphosate, in my opinion, is a train wreck for the innate immune system. And so what's happening is that we're all becoming immune compromised and different people to different degrees, depending upon how much glyphosate they've been exposed to and what their genetic makeup looks, up, looks like, what their gut bacteria are doing, all of these factors play a role. But we're, we're getting sicker day by day. The entire population is getting sicker. And you can see the medical costs are going up dramatically. The United States can't figure out how to pay for all its medical expenses. And they never ever mentioned the idea that maybe we could find a way to be healthier so that we would have fewer medical expenses. And of course the medical, uh, medical establishment is thriving. I mean, they're making so much money. They don't necessarily want us to be well. I mean, they're happy to have us sick, it seems to me, because they make money when we're sick. And so there's no motivation um, to fix the problem. And uh, this really frustrates me because if we could just get our society to recognize that you just need to do healthy living, it's very simple, eat organic diet, eat whole foods, 
you know, get a lot of uh, micronutrients in your diet and get out in the sunlight. It's very simple and, and you'll be well. And, and people need to get that message because I think it would make for a much, much better world if we had everybody practicing a lifestyle like that. What's happened when you've reported your research to the academic community? What's happened? <laughs> well, it's interesting. I've actually gotten a lot of um, feedback from various academics who have been read my paper and really loved it and wanted to follow up and discuss. And I've met a lot of great people that way. It's actually been very rewarding to expand my circle of friends among all these people who reach out to me, having read one of my papers and have interest in the same topic and have ideas. So there's a real thri there's a thriving community of researchers who are asking deep questions about how biology works and how metabolism works and how we're being poisoned. And it's been a wonderful experience. But of course, the mainstream <laughs> machinery is basically uh, worried about me, I think. And they're trying everything to do everything they can to make sure people don't hear my message. I think they're, they feel threatened. I think they are aware that I am onto something big here and that uh, they should be worried because, you know, what they're practicing and what they're teaching us is wrong. And uh, they don't want the population to know that. So they want to make sure that I'm not heard. Can you tell us more about the impact that genetically modified foods have on our health? Yeah, well, that's a really interesting question. And in fact, you know, there was such a long time that there were a lot of anti-GMO activists who were uh, worried about the GMO technology and how that might impact the plant. And it was frustrating to me that it took a long time for those folks to realize that one of the big problems with the GMOs is that they enable the toxic chemicals. And so they were sort of misguided, I think, in being worried about the GMO itself rather than the consequence of the GMO in terms of your exposure to the chemicals that the GMO enables. And that's particularly true for the glyphosate. The glyphosate GMO Roundup Ready gene is, is, is really the biggest GMO on the market. The, the, most, the biggest number of crops that have the GMO are crops that are resistant to glyphosate because of inserting a bacterial gene into the plant genome. And, um, and so, uh, in fact, when they studied the GMO crops to, to get approval, I was shocked to find out that they didn't actually expose them to glyphosate. The, the, the GMO crops that were studied to see if they were you know, substantially equivalent to the non-GMO didn't expose them to glyphosate. And it's the glyphosate that's what makes the crop bad. So it's kind of amazing to me that they don't, um, that they didn't catch on to that. I think it, it, Jeffrey Smith's a good example because it was when he met me, actually, he, he invited me to a, he, he, he visited and we did a, an interview and it actually got a lot of coverage on the web. That was one, one of my first interviews when I was first finding out about glyphosate. And I think it changed his mind because he's been a lot more focused on, on glyphosate uh, since then in which I really welcome. And I think other anti-GMO activists are, are realizing that. Whether the GMO itself is also a problem is something I've been agnostic on. And it's just because I haven't really done a deep dive into that field, I really can't say. Um, it, it could be doing all kinds of nasty things. I just uh, don't know. What is the business of agriculture, crop insurance and crop subsidies? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's just really, really sad that this country, the United States government, invests in agriculture and it protects, you know, uh, farmers from disaster, but it mostly invests in the giant mega farms that are monocrop, you know, monocrop mega farms using lots of toxic chemicals. Uh, so it really is very, very frustrating to me that the government can't seem to recognize that that's the wrong way to go. And I would love it if they would take back all that money and instead invest it into the small farmers, because what we need to do is to return to the, lar to the large number of small family farms. That's what we're losing. We're losing that. And it's a very valuable thing that we're losing. And um, it's going to be very hard to get it back, of course, because all the small farmers are, have been basically retired or dead or kicked out of the out of the field because they can't compete with the large farms. So we're in the wrong, we're going in the wrong direction with the way the subsidies are being spent. And so, um, which then encourages people, of course, to choose to, to grow agriculture in the way that they're gonna be buffered by the government if there's a disaster. So we, we just need to reverse that. And, and I'm hoping at some point the government will recognize that fact and do it. What impact do electromagnetic fields from cell phones and Wi-Fi have on our health? Well, that's a big one. And then there are a lot of people that are devoting attention to that. And again, that's one that I have not yet gotten too deep into because of all my other interests. But I do believe that they are working synergistically with glyphosate. And I'm aware of some papers 
that have shown that EMFs can actually uh, cause calcium uptake by the cells, which can be uh, toxic to the cells. And I know glyphosate also causes calcium uptake. So you've got synergistic toxicity between the EMFs and the glyphosate, which is going to be um, a double whammy. So I think that I think it's a, uh, an important field and we definitely need more research. And it, it's still, um, it's one of those things like all the other things in our environment that the industry tries very hard to say, no, there's no trouble, there's no problem, this is fine. And then you have other naysayers who are saying, no, wait a minute, look at this, look at that. And the population, the general population doesn't know who to believe. You know, It's the same thing with all of these chemicals. Please discuss the following agencies as they relate to food and agriculture regulation. The Department of Agriculture, the USDA, the EPA, the FDA, the CDC, the Patent and Trademark Office, and the FTC. <laughs> That's quite a list. I don't know much about the Patent and Trademark o Office and how they relate to it. I'm sure patents you know, are, are important, I guess, to get the patents to work. All the other ones sort of have all kinds of overlap in, their, in what they do. And sometimes they pass the buck, too, because, I mean, the FDA is concerned with food, making sure food is safe. And the EPA is concer concerned with the environment. And so, of course, the environment and the food are, are overlapping with respect to something like glyphosate. So they can point the finger at the other one and say, no, it's your problem. No, it's yours. And nobody does anything. Um, and then the uh, CDC, you know, they're really big on vaccines. They're, they're, they're supposed to be sort of immune disease, you know, trying to protect from in infectious diseases. And uh, their main game is just make sure everybody gets vaccinated, which is, I think, misguided. I think they should be teaching people to have healthy lifestyle so they have a strong immune system so that the infectious disease won't touch them. So, um, yeah, good enough, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Has there been an increase in food allergies and do you have any idea why? <laughs> do I have any idea why? I definitely do. <laughs> Another topic in my book, I talk a lot about that. It's quite fascinating. Uh, and of course, ce celiac disease is the obvious one. And of course, so many kids are having issues with their gut, you know, gut dysbiosis, leaky gut, you know, chronic, you know, bloating and pain, and diarrhea, and constipation, all these different gut issues, which is a reflection of glyphosate disrupting the gut back microbiome. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that the difficulty with digesting fats, I believe there's also a, a difficulty with digesting proteins. And that's again, shown by Anthony Samsel. He and I published a paper together where um, he measured, he, he found high levels of glyphosate in, uh, in enzymes that break down proteins into individual amino, amino acids and in lipase, which is the one that metabolizes fats. All three, of, there were two of these amino uh, protein metabolizing enzymes and then the lipase, all of them were contaminated with glyphosate. I think they're being broken by the glyphosate so that it disrupts the ability to break down protein. So when you eat wheat, wheat is a difficult protein to break down. It has a lot of proline uh, molecules in it. And um, proline, we actually get assistance from our gut microbes to break down proline because it's a difficult um, amino acid to separate from, the, from its neighbors. And the uh, gut microbes have developed specialized enzymes that can break that apart. And in particular, lactobacillus, which is hit very hard by glyphosate, is able to, to help us digest wheat. And so when lactobacillus is getting killed off by glyphosate, then we become impaired in our ability to digest the wheat. So we get these wheat proteins, the gluten segments that are uh, allergenic. And we, it also induces a leaky gut barrier. So those undigested proteins get into the general circulation. And that's when the immune cells get upset and they start developing antibodies to those proteins. And then those antibodies become autoantibodies attacking our own tissues through a mechanism called molecular mimicry. It's a well-known phenomenon. And I think that we have an epidemic. We do have an epidemic in many different autoimmune diseases. Again, that's a chapter in my book uh, that's coming out in June. And um, that uh, I think they're all uh, likely the epidemic is caused by the glyphosate's ability to disrupt um, the metabolism of those proteins. Why should we eat high sulfur foods and which foods have high sulfur? <laughs> yeah, sulfur is my big thing. And that's actually where I started in my research journey was realizing that autistic kids, you know, suffer from sulfate uh, issues, sulfate deficiencies, as well as sulfur deficiencies and impaired sulfur metabolism. Um, and I think that's true for many different diseases that they're connected to um, a sulfur deficiency, sulfur dysbiosis, I could call it, you know, and, and uh, so I've looked hard at that with respect to glyphosate. Again, I have a whole, I have at least one chapter on sulfur. 
uh, in my book, I talk a lot about um, how important I think sulfate is to the body's, uh, to much, uh, to much about the body's metabolism and how sulfate um, is disrupted in multiple ways by glyphosate. Glyphosate impairs sulfate synthesis, sulfate transport, sulfate transfer from one molecule to another. Um, just about everything about sulfate gets uh, disrupted by glyphosate. And so when you have a systemic sulfate deficiency problem, then you have a problem with insufficient structured water. And this is a fascinating field that has been developed by Jerry Pollack. It's been popularized by Jerry Pollack, professor um, in water. He, his, his field of expertise is water and it's a really that fascinating topic. And water has this gelled form. If you look at jello, that's gelled water. And it's the sulfates that populate that, for example, line all the blood vessels of your body are lined with the sulfated glycosaminoglycans that create the structured water that it houses the, uh, it coats the interior of the blood vessel and protects it from uh, everything that's in the blood. So you're basically building a shield and it also produces a very thick layer so the red blood cells can slide through with limited, uh, very little friction. So it, it promotes blood circulation. And it also produces this negative charge, which has a, a good effect as well. So there's all these, uh, and it creates an, um, an electrical circuit, which is really fascinating. Gerald Pollack talks about how the gel that's created by those sulfate molecules, the gelled water actually releases protons. It pushes them out and creates a battery that at, the, at the barrier, at the boundary between the gelled water and the fluid water that's the flowing blood. And then the, those protons are then able to be ushered into the cell to generate electrical supply for the cell. So when you have insufficient sulfate, you also have insufficient electrical circuitry supplying your tissues, which of course is essentially um, an energy problem, energy deficiency problem. Aside from glyphosate, are you concerned that other chemicals and pesticides are harming our health? Absolutely. And there's such a huge list. Um, it, it's just uh, daunting, actually, when you look at all of the things. Um, a lot of the insecticides are very toxic. Um, there are many drugs that are toxic, you know, uh, and uh, uh, plastics and uh, PCBs. I mean, there's just a huge list. And then, of course, toxic metals like aluminum, mercury, uh, the vaccines, I think, are a huge issue. Um, and so we're just completely overloaded with um, all kinds of toxic chemicals in our daily lives. And uh, it's all, it's caught up with us. I mean, it's just, we're not going to be a healthy society until we turn that around. I think we really have to be very uh, aggressive in changing our policy. The governments need to be aggressive in changing the policy towards all of these chemicals to be, instead of saying they're perfectly safe until proven otherwise, you have to use extreme caution with any new chemical because you can just have en enormous consequences that are long-term that you never would have thought of that will show up that you'll finally figure out decades later after tremendous damage has been done. This is happening over and over again. Certainly DDT is a good story and it's just this DDT repeating itself over and over again. What are your thoughts on the pharmaceutical industry? <laughs> I have not met a pharmaceutical drug that I like, <laughs> let me put it that way. I, I think it, it's just really, really heartbreaking that the, um, you know, Rockefeller and the whole story with oil and how they just dismantled all of the, in the schools, all of the um, educational framework that was teaching what is now called, you know, alternative medicine, which is really traditional medicine founded on natural products. And we need to go back to that. We need to return to that form of, of medicine because I think that pharmaceutical medicines are miserable failure. And I, I know so many that I just find it very disturbing to me. I mean, one is certainly statin drugs and I've written a lot about statin drugs and it just pains me to see all these people who, I, I see them at the airports, you know, when I go to the airport and people who are walking with a walker or they're obviously limping or they're in pain and their back is, you know, they're, they're <laughs> They just can hardly stand to walk because they're in so much pain, muscle pain and, and brain fog and um, muscle weakness. All of these things are side effects of statin drugs. Basically, they make you grow older faster. And people's, you know, my doctor says I have to take it, so I take it. I mean, I can't understand that kind of mentality. We need to understand that our doctor is not God and that if patients need to do their own research before they take any drug that their doctor prescribes, because most of the drugs have nasty, nasty side effects. And some of them don't show up until many years later. So it's insidious. A lot of them are insidious in their destruction of your body's um, 
natural mechanisms. What's happened when you've reported your research to the scientific community? <laughs> Which scientific community? You know, it's been a struggle. Uh, I have had I have had a lot of um, interesting stories about papers that I tried to get published and ran into trouble because um, probably because I'm being um, tracked by the pharmaceutical industry or the or the Monsanto type of people who are um, making sure that what I want to say doesn't get heard. And so it's a very frustrating effort to get a paper published. Uh, and I learned the hard way, you know, I had a, um, recently I had a paper that was invited paper for a special issue of a journal. And um, so, uh, and it was perfect. And I, I collaborated with, a, with one of my best buddies for collaboration. We wrote, I thought a really nice paper, we submitted it. And um, very shortly after we submitted it, we got back a letter that said it was rejected without review. And so we were quite shocked because the guy was encouraging us to submit and we didn't understand what had happened. And so we reached out to him and said, you know, what's going on here? And his answer really shocked us because he, he said, I did not know that it was retracted, re rejected. I did not know that it was rejected. So it had been taken upstairs and they had made that policy decision before he even got a chance to, to, to do anything with it. So that's the kind of thing we're up against. I mean, we did get that paper published in a different journal and it was well received, but um, that's the struggle you do. We had another one I wrote a long time ago with um, my, one of my students on statin drugs and um, arguing that statin drugs could be, explain a sort of this, a lot of health, downward health spiral among middle-aged men. And it, we looked at a, a database of health um, side effect uh, reports drug side effect reports, uh, which was a very interesting topic. And you find all kinds of amazing things that way. But we correlated the drug side effect reports with the statin drugs with these middle-aged men and came up with a story that I thought was quite compelling. We had three reviewers. It came back and it was looking good. You know, they had some comments. They were good. We fixed them. We put it, we sent it back for a second, you know, submitted our solution to those reviews. And then it came back again with a fourth reviewer who absolutely hated it and wrote huge pages of, of, you know, complaints about this and that and the other. So we very carefully answered all of his complaints. He wrote this long reply to this fourth reviewer, and then he still rejected it. You know, we couldn't get past that fourth reviewer, and then it ended up that the journal rejected it as well. So they pull in someone when they find out in the industry, I think, you know, you don't know what's going on behind closed doors, but that would be my assumption that they recognized they didn't want that paper published. They pulled in someone last minute and got it and got it squashed. So this is the kind of thing I'm up against. It's a real struggle to write papers. I've been very happy with the um, open source, open uh, open source, uh, open access, I guess it's called, um, papers, uh, journals. And there's many of these journals sprouting up all over the place and they don't have the reputation. You know, they always talk about impact factor and the mainstream likes to think that they're that they're not relevant, they're not important, but the fact is they get out on the web and anybody can read them. You don't have to pay 40 bucks. I mean, there's actually a lot of features in these. Um, and I find some of the most interesting articles are coming out of that alternative community because they're not straitjacketed the way the mainstream is in terms of what they can say. We talked about sunglasses. What impact does sunblock have on our health? And that's another one that I really hate. And I, I just, it makes me sad when I see people slobbering sunscreen all over their body. Um, it, sunscreen is toxic. Uh, in fact, it's quite interesting that, the, you know, they think they're protecting themselves from skin cancer, but actually melanoma skin cancer has been going up dramatically over time, exactly in step with the rise in the use of sunscreen. And we're getting higher and higher, you know, as sun protection levels, uh, sunscreens. When I was a kid, you got, you had five, you had eight, you know, eight was already a lot. Now it's 64. I mean, this is the degree of protection you're getting very, very strong sunscreens that are blocking the sun and uh, preventing you from getting a tan and uh, preventing you from, from making important things like vitamin D. So I think, um, you know, we have an epidemic in vitamin D deficiency along with this aggressive use of sunscreen and the uh, cancer is not improving, it's going the wrong direction. So it's like, you know, it's hello. It's like, why don't we realize that this is not working and stop doing it? Uh, aluminum in the sunscreen in the sunscreen is extremely toxic and actually aluminum uh, suppresses the enzyme in the skin that I believe is essential for making sulfate. So I think it actually disturbs the sulfate system as well. What's the key initiator of all chronic disease? <laughs> Inflammation, I guess, is what I would say. The gut, gut dysbiosis and inflammation are really central to the whole to all of these diseases. And uh, 
they're finding more and more diseases that can treat, be traced back to the gut. It's quite interesting stories with, for example, Parkinson's disease. It starts in the gut and get constipation. And then you actually get this um, uh, alpha synuclein is this protein that gets misfolded in Parkinson's and actually starts in the gut. And then the misfolded alpha synuclein gets transported to the brain stem and ends up in the, um, in that, you know, um, and not a black body that that part of the, the brainstem that's involved with uh, Parkinson's disease. It's quite fascinating, but autoimmune um, rheumatoid arthritis is traced back to the gut. And of course, autism has a lot of gut, gut connections. And so it's basically gut dysbiosis and then it's inflammation. So many diseases are connected to inflammation. And, um, and I have very uh, interesting stories that I I'm working out with respect to what inflammation is all about. Um, I'm really starting to feel that I understand it, but it's basically that uh, it's a, uh, when your normal meta metabolism is not working correctly, uh, inflammation is necessary to try to repair, particularly to repair the uh, immune cells that are weak. So the, the innate immune system is broken because of all the toxic exposures and the inflammation is a process that can heal them. And macrophages actually convert from a, what's called an M1 type to an M2 type in response to inflammation. And when they get to M2 type, now they've got more sulfate and actually the M2 type has more heparin sulfate in its membranes. And that provides that immune cell with the health it needs to be able to fight off disease. So the inflammation is helping to strengthen the immune system at the, at the expense of the organ that's being attacked because then you've got all the pain and discomfort and swelling, the red, all the nastiness that inflammation entails. Um, is necessary because that's the only way the body knows how to fix those, mit those uh, mitochondria in the macrophages once they've been damaged by all the chemicals. How do we avoid micronutrient deficiencies? <laughs> that's easy. Just eat healthy foods. And, and really, it's crucial to eat whole foods. And I'm realizing more and more that it's not just all the chemicals that are in the processed foods, but it's also the fact that those foods are so unnatural you basically take, um, take a perfectly fine food source like corn or wheat, and then they, they um, corn and soy in particular, they break them down into individual um, molecules that are almost like chemicals. You know, they get the protein and the, and the oil and, the, and then um, they just uh, reassemble those things into what I call pseudo foods. And so a good example is a soy protein bar. If you look at a soy protein bar, look at the ingredient list, it looks like a bunch of chemicals, you know, anything that looks like a bunch of chemicals has more than four or five ingredients. Don't buy it. They're not good. And, um, and because they, they actually get rid of, there's so many um, amazingly skilled molecules that are produced by plants. So I think uh, people talk a lot about a plant-based diet. I do not like a vegan diet. I think you really need to have animal uh, based foods to be healthy, but I do think that the fresh vegetables, uh, and especially the herbs and the spices are all very, very healthy foods and you should eat lots of them. And we, my husband and I always have a big salad every night with all kinds of goodies in it, you know, tomatoes and, um, and uh, well, lettuce, obviously, and then um, yeah, tomatoes and avocado and um, uh, cucumber. I mean, all these different um, wonderful things to eat that, um, and eating foods raw is also good because you have minimal processing, no processing. If you eat a raw whole food, that's no processing. So you want to aim for as little processing as possible. And you're getting all those complex polyphenols and flavonoids, uh, terpenoids. These are all really interesting molecules that the plants produce that have been shown. In fact, many of them to do things like suppressing coronavirus, you know, suppressing the uh, ability of the virus to get into the cells. So I think it, it's a very good idea to eat a lot of these healthy foods, um, particularly the herbs and spices uh, in the context of COVID-19. What is grounding and how do you do it? Yeah, grounding is wonderful. And it's just basically walking barefoot on the ground. And especially good is if you've got a seashore nearby to walk barefoot on the ground, on the sand, in the water at the shore. That's really, I think the best grounding you can get. The water is a very good um, conductor and um, the ground is very grounded in the sand. <laughs> so you're getting a really good ability to get a negative charge from the earth. So the earth is a giant negatively charged ball. And so when you're on the ground, the, the electrons are actually coming into your body and providing you with negative charge. And that's helping to make your, um, the, the um, cells that are in, in circulating the blood, like the red blood cells, 
uh, it provides them with negative charge, which helps them to stay separated because if the red blood cells, don't, they repel each other with negative charge and that keeps them well separated. Otherwise they glom together and then they can cause problems in the circulation. So um, yeah, it's a way to get, a natural way to get electricity basically uh, supplied in a healthy way to the body um, from uh, electricity supplied from the earth. And of course you can buy these ground in pads. We have one actually in our bed that you can plug it into ground and then you just lay it um, on your bed so that you're grounded when you sleep. And I think that's um, a really good thing to do. How does a teenager fix his gut health and what helps and what hurts? A teenager. Yeah, I missed that one when I was reading, um, as opposed to other people. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's the same way everyone does, just basically eating healthy foods. And, and um, I should say um, fermented foods are really good. Uh, and partly that's because of the microbes that they contain, but also vitamin K2, which is naturally found in fermented foods and very, very important for immune health important for COVID-19 as well. K2, vitamin C, which is fruit. So eating uh, fresh uh, fruits. Um, and of course the vegetables that have all these polyphenols and flavonoids, and then eating a seafood. Seafood is extremely healthy. Organic eggs uh, are one of the best foods you can eat. They have a lot of micronutrients, a lot of minerals, a lot of vitamins. And um, other uh, grass-fed beef is another really good food and organic chicken. So I think the meats are great uh, as long as they're organic. Um, the, the meats that you're getting from the CAFO cows, the confined animal feeding operations are probably very toxic. And I, I would not recommend if you, if the only meat you can get is a CAFO cow that don't eat meat, you know, so organic grass fed, all the good stuff. You really try to go for the high end foods and, and, you know, you're spending extra money, but you're getting the quality with that extra money. It's worth it. What's happened when you've reported your research to the media? <laughs> well, <laughs> some of the media has been very kind to me, I should say. And of course, that's the alternative media. And I have had a great relationship with Dr. McCullough. And I know he's being blasted by the mainstream, absolutely blasted. And he's fighting back, I think, with extraordinary capability. And I am in great admiration of people like Dr. McCullough, who are able to stand up to these people and continue to carry forth and produce excellent, excellent material day after day. Um, educating the public on what's really going on uh, in the world today. The main, there's just such an enormous gap between what's called mainstream and alternative media. And of course, all this suppression that's going on. Um, whenever you mention vaccines, if you say anything negative about vaccines, you basically are going to be taken off, you know, and it's just incredible the power that they have to, uh, to control us and to, to stop our message from getting through. That's been an incredible frustration for those of us who are, recognizing what's happening in this world and feeling somewhat powerless to fix it. You know, we feel like we have to, we have to get our message across, but we have to do it in such a way that we're constantly fighting the mainstream media in the process, which is really, really unfortunate. So you would say then that academics and, and scientists are being censored? Absolutely. Absolutely the case. Yes. I certainly have experienced it firsthand. You have a chapter in your book called Alzheimer's disease and the sulfur cycle. Please explain to us more about what that's about. Yeah, I think that chapter was cholesterol sulfate and the sulfur and the sulfur cycle, but I'm, I'm not sure. But anyway, I had, I did talk about Alzheimer's in the book and I did talk about a lot about the sulfur cycle. And that book was written by the way, in 2012, it was published much later. I wrote that book when my husband was on sabbatical in Taiwan. And this is Cindy and Erica's obsession that you're talking about. This is my only published book so far. Uh, which was a lot of fun. It's a novel. And I folded a lot of my, I was working out my own theories at the time. And so Cindy was sort of my protagonist who was, you know, <laughs> kind of me. You know, she was, she, I identified with this, uh, with the character Cindy in that, in, in that book. And uh, so she was on a journey to try to figure out, which I was on that same journey to try to figure out autism. And, um, and so it's the, um, cholesterol sulfate and the sulfur cycles. The sulfur cycle is just really, really fascinating. And that's what I've been um, deeply in intrigued by for many, many years. And it, it really has to do with, a, I, I think it's a cycle between, you know, hydrogen sulfide gas 
and then um, sulfur containing um, organic molecules like, you know, cysteine and homocysteine, glutathione, for example, contains sulfur. That's a very important antioxidant. So there's all these, um, taurine is another one, all these organic molecules that contain sulfur. There's many others actually. And they're all really important in your metabolism, but then they eventually go back to sulfate. So there's a hydrogen sulfide to organic matter to sulfate cycle and then back to hydrogen sulfide gas. So there's a complete cycle that way. And that, and that whole cycle, sulfur is actually on the same column of the periodic chart as oxygen, it's right below oxygen. And oxygen is obviously essential for life. We all know that. Uh, sulfur is also essential for life and probably equally as oxygen, although we don't realize that. And we don't even have a, um, a minimum daily requirement for sulfur. It's just assumed that we're getting plenty. So it's kind of surprising to me that it hasn't become more visible as a, as a nutrient that we need to make sure we get plenty of. And um, so, yeah, that's a sulfur cycle. And then cholesterol sulfate is uh, cholesterol sulfate was where I started because that is a really fascinating mo molecule and it's produced in the skin in response to sunlight along with vitamin D. So the skin uh, sunlight catalyzes the synthesis of vitamin D, but it also catalyzes the synthesis of cholesterol sulfate, which is then shed by the skin into the circulation. And that cholesterol sulfate, I believe is very, very important for two things, transporting cholesterol and transporting sulfate. And so when cholesterol sulfate is deficient, uh, both cholesterol and sulfate become deficient. And I believe that heart disease is actually a cholesterol sulfate deficiency problem. And so it's a quite a reversal from the, the current framework of heart disease views it as a, uh, a cholesterol excess problem. But I think that's incorrect. It's really that the heart is actually squirreling away its purpose, it's just like a, a squirrel would save nuts. It's saving cholesterol in the artery walls leading into the heart with a goal of producing cholesterol sulfate should sulfate become available. And the problem is sulfate's not available. And so it has to wait until the sulfate comes and then release the cholesterol sulfate and deliver both the cholesterol and the sulfate to the heart. And both of them are really essential for the heart's function. So when you do something like a statin drug, you're working against, you're gonna end up with heart failure over time because your heart is so deficient in cholesterol, ironically, which is the thing we think is a toxin. So cholesterol is an absolutely essential molecule for human health. And sulfate plays a very important role in, in moving it around in the body. So when there's not enough sulfate, you have to put the cholesterol inside these particles, the LDL, the HDL, these LDL particles that are considered to be so bad. You have a high serum LDL, you need to take a statin drug. You have that high LDL because you don't have enough sulfate and you can't transport the cholesterol efficiently with the sulfate version of the molecule. Have the rates of Alzheimer's gone up and what can we do to prevent Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's is going up exactly in step with autism and exactly in step with glyphosate usage. All three of them are going up in step very terrifying. I mean, we're just getting more and more uh, elderly people getting Alzheimer's earlier and earlier in life. Uh, I, I find it terrifying. It's another one of those things that I feel the government should be really focused on trying to figure out the solution to that. You know, they're, they're, they're working so hard on all these drugs and they're not getting anywhere with them. I mean, they always fail in their, in their trials and they've almost given up. The pharma has almost given up on, on Alzheimer's drugs because it's just wasted a lot of money and got nowhere. And that's because they don't understand Alzheimer's disease. They really don't understand what it's all about. And I think that it actually has to do with, um, again, the sulfur problem. Um, sulfur, um, de de sulfur desperately needed by the immune cells and the immune cells actually go into the Alzheimer's brain and steal uh, sulfur containing molecules from the brain. Uh, they raid the brain of its sulfur and it's actually a, a molecule called sulfatide sulfatide is a sulfated lip, lipid, you know, a fat. And the sulfatide gets uh, stolen from the brain by uh, APO, APOE. APO is this, uh, APOE is this uh, version of APO that's a risk factor for Alzheimer's. And it's especially good at stealing sulfatide from the, from the brain in order to supply it to the immune system um, to keep the immune cells healthy. So there's really, I think many of the diseases that we see today, the chronic diseases, are connected to a certain theme, which is that some particular tissue, some particular organ system gets sacrificed or gets majorly impaired in order to repair the immune system. And so the, the body really obsesses on making sure the immune cells are strong because that is gonna, that's gonna keep you alive. So you have to, different genetics and different microbiomes will pick and choose exactly which organ system gets wiped out. <laughs> 
in order to keep the immune system strong enough to keep going. Is there a relation between autism and cholesterol? Yeah, that's quite interesting, actually. You know, there's a uh, condition called uh, SLOS, S-L-O-S, uh, and I have it written, smith lemley Opitz <laughs> smith lemley Opitz syndrome, SLOS, um, which is a genetic disease, and it has to do with um, a defective uh, gene. And you can't, they, they, they can't make cholesterol. It's a defect in the ability to synthesize cholesterol. And the kids who have this condition, almost all of them suffer from autism. So it's, it seems very clear that cholesterol plays an important role in autism. And I think it's more cholesterol sulfate. And that's, I talk a lot about that. And that goes way back in my research. That was one of the first things I figured out was that cholesterol sulfate um, impairment deficiency is connected to both autism and heart disease and probably other diseases as well, but certainly those two. And so, um, and I mentioned already uh, earlier, I mentioned about heparin sulfate in the autistic brain. I can say that again, um, heparin sulfate deficiency in the autistic brain is, is seen both in uh, humans post-mortem studies and also in um, various rat models. Mouse rat models or mouse models of autism have um, impaired heparin sulfate supply in the brain ventricles. That heparin sulfate is crucial. That's the place where the neurons evolve. They, they mature out of that area and migrate to where they need to go and evolve into normal neuron function. And that whole process is critically dependent on having adequate amounts of heparin sulfate. So when the heparin sulfate is deficient, the brain doesn't develop correctly. And then that gives you the features of autism. So um, I think it's, uh, and the heparin sulfate is being supplied with sulfate through the cholesterol sulfate. That's what I think. So that's how that all connects up. But the cholesterol sulfate is able to um, move sulfate around in the body very nicely and get it to where it needs to go. What are biofuels and what does that have to do with our health and, and the COVID epidemic? Yeah, that's really an interesting topic. I kind of got caught up on that uh, in April, starting in April, as I looked around and saw where COVID-19 was happening and how it was connected to places that had a lot of um, air pollution. You know, in, in Northern Italy, um, in Wuhan and Northern Italy and New York City all have quite, you know, San Francisco, LA, I guess all those sort of out places where the outbreaks happened first. Uh, have some a lot of issues with air pollution. And in fact, there have been papers that have shown both from Europe and the United States have shown a correlation between air pollution, nanoparticle si levels and uh, COVID-19 uh, mortality rates in different parts of the country, of the world, actually. And so um, connecting air pollution to COVID-19 and then to say, what is it in the air that's causing the problem? And I zeroed in on the biofuels uh, really because the countries that are being hit hardest are countries that are char characterized by high use of glyphosate and uh, forerunners, they're front runners in the biofuel development. The biofuels are, um, are quite interesting. And what they're trying to do is to, to avoid using petroleum products by um, using food crops actually in many cases uh, and going through a process, processing plant that turns them into fuel. And um, the food crops, for example, wheat, you know, so wheat crops, canola crops, they're they're sprayed with glyphosate right before harvest. They're harvested. And then the residue that's left over the stalks and the crud is packaged up on a barge and shipped down to New York City and run through a factory there that turns it into fuel. And that can be biogas. Uh, there's a bioheating oil. There's, of course, ethanol, which is now in our gasoline. The U.S. has 10% ethanol typically in the gas tank. And I suspect that ethanol is contaminated with glyphosate. And then you have these... Um, the biofuels, the um, biodiesel fuel, which is being heavily used in Europe. Europe imports a lot of its biodiesel from Argentina, which derives it from GMO Roundup Ready soybeans. So whenever you look at the sources of these biofuels, um, you can see that there's potential for glyphosate contamination in them. And then the, so the glyphosate, if it got, if it reached combustion, it would be broken down. It, it, the combustion temperature would break it down. But, it, but you have a lot of poorly tuned buses. You know, you see a bus that takes off and there's this big spew of dark gas coming out and it smells terrible. Glyphosate could be getting emitted before it reaches combustion, I think. And uh, certainly organic molecules do get uh, released. And they analyze, you know, various organic components in these in these released uh, fumes that come out of these uh, poorly tuned vehicles. And so I think, you know, New York City has 11,000 buses where they have, have um, adopted um, biodiesel fuel, you know, and so um, there's a lot of opportunity for the vehicles on the road. The airplanes have been, uh, the airplane industry has been adopting biofuels for the airplanes. 
And so um, it's quite remarkable to see how much there is and how much it's growing. It's actually accelerated. The biofuel industry has really blossomed in the last few years. So it's going up very dramatically in those countries that are investing in it. And the ones that are not um, have a much lower COVID-19 uh, infection rates, quite interesting, for example. And I looked, in fact, at, um, at air pollution because you could, I could get numbers on nanoparticle air pollution for different countries and then get numbers on the death rate from COVID-19. And I plotted those two against each other. And it was actually interesting because the correlation was all screwed up. There were a lot of countries that had very high um, nanoparticle levels, very poor air, air, air quality, and very low COVID-19. And there were other countries that had relatively low, actually quite good numbers on the nanoparticles and very high COVID-19. So the correlation wasn't there. It was there for Europe, it was there for America, but it wasn't there for the world. And so what I found was that those countries that had the high air pollution did not have, were not using, using low levels of glyphosate and were not investing in biofuels. Whereas the ones that had um, the, the lower air pollution on the, on the high end of the COVID-19, they were Europe and America, um, South Africa, Brazil, you know, these are all the countries that have been really bad uh, COVID-19 break outbreaks and high glyphosate and high biofuel development in many cases. So those things all seem to tie together. And so I'm thinking that you're breathing the glyphosate and the glyphosate is affecting the lungs immune system because it wrecks the immune cells. So when the immune cells in the lung are broken by the glyphosate, you can't fight off the virus and the virus gains an upper hand and then you get very sick. What are NARC1 or NARC1 inhibitors and what are CETP inhibitors and what do we need to know about this? Yeah, that comes from one of the articles that one of the web posts that Cindy wrote in the Cindy and Erica Obsession book. So, um, and that was a fun study. This was, of course, in 2012. So it's a long time ago when I looked into that. But it, it is interesting because they're, they're trying to find these other ways to deal with the cholesterol. They think this, they're obsessed. You know, the pharma is obsessed with the cholesterol levels in their blood. And they're always trying to figure out how to, how to fix that. And so CETP, CETP inhibitors are um, cholesterol ester uh, transport uh, inhibitors, <laughs> protein, cholesterol ester transport protein inhibitors. And uh, that, that protein, CETP, actually moves cholesterol around between HDL particles and LDL particles. And what they found was that, it, so first of all, they know high HDL is supposed to be good and, and low uh, LDL is good. So you were trying to make high HDL, low LDL. So thus those uh, CTP actually transfers cholesterol from HDL to LDL and, and then causes, um, causes HDL to go down. So they figured if we can suppress, this is how they think. I mean, they always think in terms of making the numbers look good. If we can suppress the ETP, then the HDL will go skyrocket because it can't hand off its cholesterol. We'll get really great numbers for, for HDL and that will be great because high HDL is good. I mean, it's so illogical to me because what they're doing is poisoning the HDL particle so that it can't deliver its goods and then wondering why it didn't work. So they had, you know, they were a complete failure. I mean, they, they thought that was a great idea because you can make the HDL numbers look so good but you weren't actually making the HDL be useful because you were blocking its ability to do its job. It couldn't deliver the cholesterol. And the PCSK9 inhibitors are really fascinating. And I really studied them a lot back when that was right when they were just coming out. And um, PCSK9, uh, that's the NARC1, is also known as PCSK9. They're very, very expensive and it's, it's, a, it's a shot, you know, and so they're people who can't get their cholesterol numbers low enough with their statin drug, then they put them on this on top of the statin drug, I think in many cases, or maybe if they have statin drug sensitivities. Um, and it's very scary to me because PCSK9, that protein, it's something called a proprotein con convertase. It's a member of a very, very high level class of proteins that are regulatory proteins. It controls um, at a high level, the, the cholesterol distribution in the body. And it does so, it's quite interesting because it binds to the LDL receptors in the liver. So the liver has these LDL receptors which go to the membranes and pull back in the LDL particles for recycling after they've already delivered their goods. They become sort of what's called small dense LDL particles and then they're taken back by the liver and recycled. And so those receptors are, the, are critical for doing that. And this PCSK9 actually ties up the receptors inside the cell. They stick to them and they won't let them go to the membrane. 
So then you can't, the liver can't bring the LDL back and the LDL levels go up. And so that's bad. They're trying to make the LDL levels go down. So if they basically destroy PCSK9 with this inhibitor, then the, um, in the liver, those receptors are very, are capable of getting to the membrane and pulling the LDL back. And, and so that's great because the LDL levels go down and everything looks good. But the fact is the liver is not taking back that LDL for a good reason. And that reason is it doesn't have enough sulfate. And if it doesn't have enough sulfate, it doesn't know how to handle cholesterol. It can't store the cholesterol effectively. It can't make the bile acids. There's lots of things it can't do with that cholesterol. Cholesterol becomes toxic if you can't manage it properly. And the sulfate is critical for making cholesterol water soluble. And so cholesterol sulfate actually goes out in the bile acids. It gets converted into other molecules to drive from cholesterol in the bile acids and shipped out, shipped back to the gut and out to the body. So that whole process actually breaks down <clears throat> when you don't have enough sulfate. And so what happens, very interesting, the biology, sulfate actually binds to the PCSK9 inhibitors, to the PCSK9 molecules, and keeps them from binding to the LDL receptor so they can go and get the LDL. In other words, if there's enough sulfate, the PCSK9 gets naturally inhibited because the sulfate's there to fix the problem. If you can take back the cholesterol, you can use it well. When you use one of these toxic inhibitors instead, you let the liver take it back even though it doesn't have enough sulfate. So what I predict is that you would end up with liver, um, fatty liver disease and liver damage uh, with those inhibitors. You mentioned a theory regarding the collaboration of water and light to do magical things. What is this relationship and what can be produced? How can we do this for our own benefit? Yeah, it's really beautiful to look at water and light. I mean, they're just such special things and I, I just... I just love them. <laughs> Water is, is just one of the most interesting molecules you could ever imagine. Of course, it's the basis of life. And we are um, mostly water. You know, we have more water mo molecules by far than anything else in our body. And as I mentioned earlier, the water um, forms this gel. It, 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 most parts of the body have the water in a gelled form. Inside the cells, outside the cells, you know, in the tissues, only uh, critical things like the blood and the lymph system have to be able to flow. So you need flowing water in the, in the blood and other, everywhere else you wanna have gelled water. And that becomes a tricky thing for the body to keep the water flowing in the blood. You don't wanna gel the blood basically. And so um, the sulfate I mentioned earlier is, is critical for making the gelled water. And um, sulfate transport is tricky because sulfate will gel the, the blood. So what you have to do is attach sulfate to various molecules that are sulfate carriers. And the body has figured out how to do that with the, all the cholesterol and all of its derivatives and um, the um, aromatic amino acids and all of their derivatives. Those are the neurotransmitters and all those different uh, terpenoids and, and flavonoids that the plants make. All those things are able to cart sulfate around. And, and the body makes extensive use of all these sulfate, what I call them sulfate transporter molecules. Um, most of which get derailed by glyphosate. So this is one of the reasons why sulfate deficiency occurs with glyphosate because these transporters, uh, this tra transport system is broken. And um, the sulfate makes the gelled water, the gelled water grows in the presence of, of light. So uh, Gerald Pollack showed that when you, especially infrared light, when you expose um, the gel to light, it grows bigger. It makes more gel, which means it makes a stronger battery. So the gel makes a battery by pushing out protons to the, uh, to the place where the gel interfaces with the fluid water in the blood, for example. And when you shine sunlight, sunlight, first of all, triggers sulfate synthesis, which of course is gonna grow the gel. And experimentally it was shown that the infrared grew it by a factor of four. So when you're exposed to, um, to sunlight and it's actually capturing the energy of the sunlight uh, through the mechanism of making the sulfate. So it's quite beautiful what happens. And, um, and you get a, a healthy gel, higher um, battery strength, more energy, and generally just uh, a sense of well being. Please discuss structured and unstructured water and how can we benefit from this? Yeah, so unstructured and structured water is another term for fluid. Structured is, uh, is gelled, and unstructured is fluid. So that's the same thing as um, gelled water and fluid water. Uh, it's also known as exclusion zone water. The structured water is, has lots of names, it's structured water, gelled water, exclusion zone water. And that's exclusion zone water because it excludes. So that becomes almost like a pure water crystal. A lot, I call it liquid ice, actually. It's a pure water crystal. And water molecules organize into all these different ways. I mean, water actually has, has memory, has information. It has the ability to store information. 
And there's a lot of fascinating work around that concept. That's related to homeopathy too, that the water can store the information of the molecule that was diluted down, diluted down more and more, but still the water has the information of that molecule that can become a useful therapy. And so, um, so water, I mean, water is just an amazing uh, uh, molecule with um, tremendous um, roles in the body uh, that many of which we still really don't understand. There's a lot of puzzles and it's very, very difficult to figure it out. So uh, I'm a great admirer of Gerald Pollack who has really come a long ways and has done some wonderful experiments to demonstrate the powers of water when you provide it with a surface that can create a gel and how much that, especially in a tube, you create all kinds of interesting things. You can actually create water flow in a tube with no uh, extra energy source just by using the gel um, to maintain that gelled water and the gelled water generates the electrical field. It's really quite fascinating. So um, you know, water is absolutely crucial for our health and it, um, and it performs many, many functions in this way of separating itself into fluid water and gelled water. Please discuss the relationship between the ability for lysomes to clear molecule, molecule debris and the eventual impact of Alzheimer's disease from amyloid beta plaque. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so lysosomes, that is lysosomes. Lysosomes, yeah. excuse me. Yeah, and those are, um, those are little digestive systems inside the cell. It's quite fascinating because the a cell um, takes in something from the membrane into, and makes a, this lipid particle called an endosome. And then the endosome gets acidified as it becomes more and more acidic, it turns into a lysosome. And it's picked up all you know, what nutrients, for example, that it can bring into that lysosome. And when it gets that acidic environment, just like the stomach has an acidic environment, the acid is uh, essential for breaking down those molecules into smaller molecules. And then they use them as building blocks to build up new, new, uh, new sources. So it's a recycling of um, damaged, really often damaged molecules, often they get oxidized, you know, or glycated, all these kinds of issues that happen with exposures. And then they get, they have to be cleared and recycled and the lysosome plays an essential role in doing that. So uh, with Alzheimer's, I think Alzheimer's has a key component of Alzheimer's is uh, impaired lysosomes, inability to clear cellular debris. And that gets back too to the melatonin sulfate problem because the melatonin sulfate is released by the pineal gland at night and that provides this, both the melatonin and the sulfate are useful for helping to um, digest, to, to clear the debris. And Alzheimer's has, uh, is characterized by a buildup of this amyloid beta plaque, misfolded amyloid beta protein that causes these plaque, plaques to show up in the Alzheimer's brain. And they accumulate because the neurons are unable to um, break them down because of a impaired uh, lysosome. And that's because of impaired sulfate supply. <laughs> and also impaired electricity because the electricity that um, helps to support that uh, acidic environment is derived from those uh, gelled water that's getting disrupted because of insufficient sulfate. A little bit complicated there, but. <laughs> Why was it important for you to come here and speak at the Real Truth About Health Conference? <laughs> I'm delighted that you've invited me to speak here and I know it's been going on for many years and I'm, this is my first year participating and I hope it will work out well for everybody. I love the fact that you're providing information uh, for free, you know, not charging any money for, to watch these uh, videos and I hope there'll be many people who watch them and learn from them and help the, uh, to educate the general public on some very urgent topics that they need to get to know, to know about. Well, we thank you for sharing all of your life's work, uh, very meaningful and uh, meaningful certainly to our audiences as well. So thank you for all of that. And thank you for your time today. Thank you. And My we, pleasure. We, we wish you well. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.